Hey everyone, Gil Gross here. You've got another Wimbledon 2024 recap show. Day six, the conclusion of the third round where I'm gonna be getting into a lot of results. Uh, you may have seen, but just in case you haven't, the five set Carlos Alcaraz versus Francis Tiafo match got its own in-depth analysis, which was posted separately on the YouTube channel on the podcast feed. So do keep in mind that although that was one of the most intriguing third round matchups that we witnessed, it won't be a part of this show because we've already covered it. I'll talk about Sviantek Putinseva. I'll talk about Shelton Shapovalov. I'll talk about Radu Kanu pulling from the mixed doubles. I'll go over Djokovic versus Popperin. And then we'll have some quick hitters. At the end of this, I'll run through every fourth round matchup on the men's side at Wimbledon. I'll give my my quick predictions for all of them. I want to start with the upset of the day, a title contender. My pick to win it in Iga Sviantek, although I wasn't all that convinced. She felt like the best choice for me. I do have this kind of long-standing belief that a player who is that dominant on everything from not just clay courts, but quick hard courts. Like someone who can be as dominant as Iga has been on hard courts will figure out grass. It's just going to happen. That is my philosophy. You can say I was proven wrong, but I would contend that it's more of a long-term uh, conviction on my end, meaning if Iga retires and has never won Wimbledon, I will be surprised, as bad as it's looked so far. Uh, so far, so far, my my philosophy and my uh, my belief system has not served me well. Although this is probably this is the first year that I I picked her to win. Uh, so far, it hasn't. But I'm I'm confident at some point it's maybe going to come through. One of the concerning things is that Iga Iga's losses at Wimbledon haven't been pretty. So it's not just that she's lost. It's not just that she's lost early. It, in many cases, it's been how she lost. In fact, the best loss was probably last year against Fidelina. That was at least in the quarterfinals, although she nearly lost to Bencic and had to save match points in the round before. This time, Yulia Putinseva beats her in three sets, and the latter two sets were ugly. They were 6-1, 6-2. Before I get into the tennis, and full disclosure, I started watching this one at the end of the second set. I watched the entirety of the third set. Between the second and the third set, something very interesting and something that, in my opinion, was very important happened. Sviantek went off court for a change of attire break. At least I assume it was a change of attire break based on how long she was off. You get some extra time if you tell the chair umpire, hey, by the way, I'm not only going to the bathroom, I'm changing my clothes. Putinseva was ready to go. She got up out of her chair. She started standing on her, ba her baseline. And she waited and she waited and she waited. And then she complained. And she said, what's taking so long? Where is my opponent? I'm ready to go in this third set. She got annoyed. The crowd, as crowds normally Crowds normally react this way. They are not sympathetic to a player who's taking a long time off court. And what happened here between the second and the third set is at a pivotal point in the match, obviously, because after a 6-1 second set, you're looking for a tone setter. You're looking for a reset at the start of the third. That might be why Iga went off court and took as long as she did, because she was looking to reset the energy of the match. The energy instead was set in a place that favored Putin Seva in a big way. The crowd got vocal behind Putin Seva and Yulia was fired up. Like she was mad about what just transpired. And instead of getting tight, instead of having a, a letdown in her intensity at the start of the third set, which you see sometimes it's natural when the scoreboard resets and it's love all again, instead of that happening, she came out like a, like a caged bull at the start of the third. So did the crowd. 
And I was thinking at the end of the second that Iga's still going to win this tennis match. It didn't take me long at the start of the third just feeling the energy in that, even though I wasn't inside court one, I could just feel it. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is a really bad energy for Sviantek. And her going off court just didn't, I, I'm, you know, it's surprise. I know it's weird to harp on this so much, but you could feel that it was significant from an energy and emotion standpoint. All right. As far as the tennis, look, Putin Seva got into an unbelievable zone here. She delivered a very unsettling mix of drop shots and pacey ground strokes. Drop shots make sense against Iga. They always have. She's going to get to them. She's not going to give you a lot of opportunities necessarily to hit them because of her quality of ball. But once she's up at net, she's not always going to make really good plays with her hands and her feel. And her volleys can be very hit and miss. Putin Seva is one of the most frequent drop shotters on the WTA tour, regardless of the opponent. And then she follows it up with some of the best lobs, I believe, on the WTA tour. So you have the drop shots. You have the big hitting, a lot of depth, a lot of play through the middle of the court, actually. You also have Putin Seva's quickness, great scrambling. And we'll get to why that was a problem for Sviantek. You also had the returning from Putin Seva where... Iga's speeds, which was one of the main reasons why I felt liberated to pick Sviantek to win Wimbledon this year was because I saw that she had completely beefed up her first serve and she was getting she was getting cheat points. She was getting unreturned serves. Mostly with an, a, a bump up in speed. An extra 8 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour. It's going to make a big difference. And a lot of the free points that, that she's been getting recently, they've been body serves. Putin Seva was not having any of that. She's got, you know, she's a five foot four player. She's got shorter arms. She's very, very quick. She doesn't stand that far in, not, not super far back like some of the ATP guys, but not super far in. And the body serve just wasn't going to happen. And she was taking full blooded cuts off of like 110 mile per hour first serves and connecting. So it was just coming back really hard at Iga. And uh, the, you know, anytime Sviantek didn't hit her spot on the first serve, the pace just didn't seem to matter because Putin Seva was just seeing it like a watermelon. That said, Sviantek was bad. She was not good at all. Her forehand melted down utterly. Her forehand was uh, was untenable in this third set, especially. Statistically, 10 unforced errors to two winners. For the match, and this was the stat that is, I think, the money stat for the match. Uh, Sviantek hit 28 forehand unforced errors in the match. Putin Seva hit three. And the forehand issues are pretty consistent with Iga's losses at Wimbledon. You got the Western grip. You got the lower bounce, which isn't good when you talk about the incoming ball. It also isn't good when you talk about her outgoing ball. So you have preferred contact point, which is going to be a little higher for Iga with the, her Western grip. You also have damage, effect of her outgoing ball, which is going to be a little bit less damaging because her heavy RPMs aren't going to have the same effect. That said, like, what are we talking about here with Iga's forehand? Not so much the subtle nuances of, oh, her, her forehand was sitting up a little bit, or she made a couple of errors off of, you know, super low, like backhand slices by Putin Saver or anything. No, she's just not making her forehand in the court at a high enough rate to give herself a chance, right? That That's what's happening here. And I am shocked at how many times that's happened to her at Wimbledon, where the forehand has gone completely off the rails. Because there's a lot of logic that makes sense there. Okay, extreme grip. Every Everything about the way she produces her forehand feels like it should be diminished on grass. But wow, diminished this much? Diminished... 
to the extent that she can't she can't make it in the court that to me is surprising this episode is brought to you by mando what's the most valuable thing in the world a reliable second serve we all know that second most valuable thing is time and time is what i spent many years wasting worried about body odor and when the deodorant that i applied in the morning was gonna stop working and i was gonna need to take a second shower before i went out again since I switched to Mando whole body deodorant, that hasn't been happening anymore. And I know that maybe after I play tennis in this hot summer heat, as long as I change my shirt, I might be able to go pick up food or go to the grocery store real quick before coming back home instead of knowing that I would be an absolute menace to society. Mando doesn't cover up odor after the fact with heavy fragrances like other deodorants sometimes do. It stops odor at the source by blocking the bacteria on your skin from eating your sweat, which is the actual cause of BO. So this means Mando is clinically proven to control odor for up to 72 hours, which is a really long time. So give yourself the precious gift of time and get yourself some Mando whole body deodorant. Special offer, new customers get $5 off Mando's best-selling starter pack with the code GILL at shopmando.com. That's code GILL, G-I-L-L. -L. What I like most about Mando is the versatility. This is a whole stick deodorant by Mando, and it's great. I love using that on my armpits, but there are other parts of your body that might smell. What about your packages, your belly buttons, your butt cracks, your stomach folds, your feet? That's where a lot of these other products come in. Here is the Invisible Cream deodorant. Here are Mando's deodorant wipes, which I love. What about the shower? Here's your body wash that's going to act as your odor shield. Mando's starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, the cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice. Free shipping. Luckily, I have a discount code to get you hooked with my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code GILL. That equates to over 40% off of your starter pack. So use code GILL at shopmando.com. This morning, most of my attention was focused on Ben Shelton versus Dennis Shapovalov, the lefty firecrackers. Ben looking to make yet another run at a major despite the best of three results, maybe not suggesting in the lead up at least, maybe not suggesting that that was in the cards. And Dennis, this has been his, the tournament that's been kind of his saving grace. Just look at his his rankings points breakdown. Wimbledon has been where he's felt at home. Once these two are trading ground strokes, it feels like roulette. It feels like, yeah, you know, random a, a random collection of winners and unforced errors with zero pattern to it and and maybe I'm completely oversimplifying and maybe I'm even missing something but I just felt that there were a lot of unforced errors from both when they were asked to play a lot off the ground it didn't matter who it was Chapo Ben they were both somewhat erratic when there were too many questions being asked of them. So how do you avoid having to answer those questions? You figure out ways to win quick points with your serve. And that's what I thought this was about. Shapovalov had a couple of issues. One, he was very predictable hitting his slice serve to, to uh, Shelton's forehand. Shapo hit 62%, sorry, actually 66% of serves to Ben's forehand. So on the ad side, he was going out wide. On the deuce side, he was going T. It's too predictable unless you're exposing a weakness. And frankly, I think Shelton's backhand return arguably has more issues than his forehand return. Although neither of them are forged in steel, I wouldn't say. Uh, but... You know, it's not like he's exploiting a weakness there. So when when you're hitting 66% of your first serves to one target, you're giving your opponent an advantage. And Shelton, it was uh, it was the exact opposite. Sometimes I feel that Ben's serve can be a little bit overrated because it's not very precise. And there have been matches where I've felt like for as as big as Shelton, as big and explosive as Shelton's serves are. 
Sometimes he's not getting the reward. He's not getting the purchase. If I showed you the ace numbers for the year, this year you'd probably be surprised at how low Shelton is. Like what if I told you that Sebastian Corda and Ben Shelton have basically identical ace rates? Meanwhile, everybody praises Ben's serve endlessly and usually says that Corda's serve should be better. So that's just an ace rate thing. But this was not one of those matches. This was a match where I thought Shelton's serve shined and his it, its full potential was on display. In sharp contrast to Dennis, Shelton had no pattern to his serve. He was hitting all three targets, not just hitting to both corners, but also hitting the body serve to great effect. And he was hitting, hitting all three spins. I saw some bombs, flat, 135. I saw some slice serves in that, you know, 122-ish range, maybe 120, where he's getting that nasty uh, left-to-right tail on the ball. And then I saw the kickers, not just on the second serve, but on the first serve as well. Those would normally be around 110 to 105 miles per hour. Yeah, not very fast at all. But the kick serve was way more effective than I thought it would be. I know that I've kind of poo-pooed the kick serve effectiveness on the grass, uh, but the fact is it wasn't about the kick. It was about the angle he was getting on the kick. And it was the fact that it didn't need to get all that high. Shapovalov's 5'11 and has a one-handed backhand. Mattia Bellucci, who he played in the first round, he is less than 5'11". He's shorter than that. So it didn't need to kick all that high. But I'll tell you what, Shelton's best serve in his first round against Bellucci and in this match against Shapovalov was his kick serve out wide on the deuce side. And part of that was the lefty-to-lefty dynamics. This kick serve that Shelton brings um, and you know kicks out high to their backhand, that's just not something they contend with. Why? Well, righties don't do it because when righties hit to their backhands— they're usually slicing the serve. Righties aren't normally hitting a kick wide on the deuce side. They want to slice that out wide so that they can create some width. When they go T, they could kick it, but it doesn't, it doesn't tail away from, from their backhands like they want it to. So usually righties are hitting the slice. What about lefties? Well, what you'll often see with lefties is they don't really develop much of a kick serve because they usually play righties, and what they can do is what righties do to lefties. They can just hit slice serves to the righty backhand. They can get the ball to tail away from the righty backhand. Of course, they can also go body like anybody else, but there's a tendency for lefties to not develop the kick serve. Ben Shelton very much has, and when you really think about it from Dennis's perspective, when does he see a lefty kick serve high to his backhand? He just doesn't. So it was a very effective serve, just like it was against Bellucci, another lefty. Now, how do you defend it if you're if you're Shapo? You can stand closer to cut off the angle. The problem was he was contending with Shelton's second most effective serve throughout the match. That was the serve hard into Shapovalov's body. And the closer you stand in to potentially cut off that sharp kicking angle or on the other side, sometimes that sharp sliced angle on, on the ad side, the closer you stand in to, to cut off Shelton's angles, uh, the more you expose yourself to that hard serve into your body. Lose-lose situation, Ben has all the serves. What Chapa was doing for most of the match was blocking returns back in play, which is smart. You got to do it. But it turned Ben into a serve and volleyer, especially with the with how deep Shapovalov was standing. It's one thing standing up close to the baseline a la Roger Federer or even Stan Wawrinka and blocking the ball. That can sometimes trouble the serve and volleyer because there's not as much time for them to close in on the net. Shapo was standing pretty deep and chipping returns. That is a prime serve and volley opportunity. 
and Shelton did not hesitate to take it. Now, I think Shelton is going to get way better at serve and volleying. I don't think he's there yet. Movement-wise, he was not always on balance. Sometimes he looked like a bull in a china shop charging in towards the service line, and then like he struggled to go left or go right because uh, he just wasn't really in control when he was closing in on the net. Uh, then also he sometimes isn't very clinical on his volleys. The commentator on the World Feed BBC, I don't know who it was, but uh, he was talking about the difference between Shelton's backhand volley, which is usually really good, and the forehand volley, which is usually not very good. I agree with that commentator, that analyst, that there is a big difference between Shelton's backhand and forehand volleys. But the reason why, despite Shelton not being super polished as a serve and volleyer, he was still winning a lot of points with it is because it was the right tactic and he kept getting good looks on it. He kept getting high percentage volley looks. So Shelton ends up 52 for 78 at the net for the match. That is of the total points that Shelton won in the entire match, one out of every three were one at net. Pretty good for Ben. One last factor on the serve dynamic. Shelton's second serve is way better. Chapeau double faulted 13 times, averaging 100 miles per hour on his second serve. Shelton double faulted four times, averaging 107 miles per hour with more difficult spins, relatively speaking, to handle. So, you know, nastier action on the ball, faster Way less double faults. I'm thinking about the tour right now. I feel like double faulting as an issue is really under control. Like there aren't a lot of players who you could point to and say they double fault too much. Shapovalov is one of the rare guys where that double fault, where, where the double fault rate usually hurts him. So again, just want to go back to my original point real quick before I move on from this. If baseline play was roulette, Shelton's superior serving dynamics, for all the reasons I just talked about, meant that instead of playing roulette all the time, he could step away from the table on serve games. He could get some free points. He could get some easy volleys on the serve and volley. And then he could roll the dice a few extra times on return because Chapo wasn't getting the same sort of positive dynamics with his serve. A couple of other points I do want to make about this match. Um, Shapovalov, still a pretty, you know, still a pretty talented ball striker. There's no doubt about it. But I got the sense watching today that he has lost some explosiveness. Really looked that way on his one-handed backhand in particular. It used to be that that one-hander was uh, a thunderbolt. It was a bone-crushing ground stroke. It was scary. He could hit it into huge targets and still do a ton of damage with it. Didn't get that sense today out of the Shapovalov backhand. I feel like it's kind of lost the bite and it's kept the errors. I'm not sure that Shapo, from a firepower standpoint, is where he used to be when he was a top 20 player, which might sound obvious, but I just want to say it out loud because I find that usually and rightly so, the criticisms being levied on Shapo and the explanations that are being presented for why Shapovalov has struggled to be a top player as of late is because he's too erratic and his decision-making is terrible and he tries to crush the living daylights out of every ball and he makes way too many errors. But remember, all of those things were the case when Shapo was top 20. All of the criticisms that, that I just went through, they were all true when he was top 20. So what has changed here? Maybe the, the explosiveness, the damage, and I don't have a great explanation for that other than there have been a lot of injuries. So we see the delta between Shelton's best of three set results and best of five set results continue to grow. Best of three set, win-loss record, career long, 34 and 34, 50%. Best of five, 
He is now 17 and seven. That is a 71% win rate. How good is that perspective? If you win 70% of your matches, you're basically guaranteed a spot in the top 10, like year long. Year long, that's a top 10 rate, top 10 win rate. 50%, not so much. So split the difference, and you see why Ben Shelton is ranked between 10 and 20 right now. Emiratu Kanu pulled out of uh, the mixed doubles with Andy Murray. So let me address that real quick. First of all, I read the news and immediately I thought, bummer, but I don't think Andy will be too gutted. He got the farewell ceremony. He finished it off with his brother. It seems like playing overall is somewhat of a painful process for him right now. Otherwise, guess what? He wouldn't be retiring. So I just felt like the ending was satisfying enough with Jamie that the fact that he doesn't play the mixed, I don't think he'll be too broken up about it. And I took solace in that. Is that somewhat of an assumption by me? Is it? Is it me somewhat? Yes. Uh, obviously, I don't know how Andy really feels about it. My sense is that he won't be too gutted. What about Emma? Is she open for criticism here? I guess that's the question. Well, I think any... Anyone who wants to treat an issue like this with any semblance of fairness just can't make a judgment based on the information that we have. The nature of this wrist issue is completely unknown right now. And without really knowing, you know, you can't say, you can't call balls and strikes on this. You can't call fair play or foul play without knowing exactly what Emma's dealing with. I think that is simple and speaks for itself. That said, uh, you have to know, Emma has to know what she signed up for. And if this is a case of, I just need to prioritize the singles right now, if that's the calculus, that would be, that would be foul play. Would it be a risk if she played mixed doubles? Is it a health risk? Does it put her, her surgically repaired wrists, it wrists in some sort of jeopardy? Because if so, well, now, now you do need to be selfish. Now you're talking about something serious here. Now you're talking about something long-term. But if you're just looking at this Wimbledon singles run, okay, you signed up to potentially make sacrifices with that. So you got to, at that point, hold up your end of the bargain and realize it's a little bit bigger than yourself in this case because that's what you signed up for. Right? Djokovic versus Popperin. This is a four setter. Djokovic loses the first. He comes back to win the second and the third. I, I would say in dominant fashion, even though scoreline wouldn't suggest that. It's just he was cruising on serve. And then uh, the fourth set, I think Popperin really stepped it up. They played a really good set of tennis. and uh, But then Djokovic played an awesome tie break and won it if memory serves, seven points to two. I didn't put put much stock in Djokovic losing the first set because Popperin, other than that one game, which was a three-all game where Novak got sloppy, but other than that, than that three-all game, Popperin didn't sniff return success. I mean, he couldn't handle Djokovic's serve whatsoever. So going into the second set, I was looking at that break of serve as a bit of an anomaly. The dynamics in the match were suggesting that Popperin was going to have a lot of difficulty breaking because it was like, hold it, love, hold it, 15, Popperin break, hold it, 15, hold it, love. You know, that that's how it went. So you look at that break serve, it just looked like an outlier. And then as the second and the third set played out, it really was an outlier because Djokovic was absolutely dominant with his first serve. Uh, for the match, he would end up winning uh, 88%. 69 out of 78 with his first serve. And at the end of the day, what was really evident in this match was an enormous gulf in return skill that was just unmistakable and blatant. 
I mean, Djokovic started to read the serve in the second set. It took him a bit. And Popperin was serve and volleying a lot and just getting burned on it because the returns were on point from Novak. So Popperin in the second set was two for 10 at the net. And you almost never see, like I always say, 50% is bad. Now, if, if you're serve and volleying, it's going to actually usually drive your percentage down just a little bit. Sometimes you're going to end up with some tough volleys. It's just how it works. Uh, but two of 10 is really bad. Third set, it got a little bit better, but not much better. Meanwhile, Popperin just couldn't get returns in play. He just was not able to make returns on a consistent basis against Djokovic's pinpoint spot serving. The other thing is Djokovic knew Popperin couldn't trade his backhand consistently. He took advantage of that. Now, Alexi sliced with more proficiency than I knew he was capable of. There were moments in the match where uh, Popperin was slicing a lot of his backhands, and that was actually driving up Popperin's consistency. It's just remarkable how well Djokovic handled it. Novak's backhand slice over the years has gotten really, really good. So when he needed to respond to a great slice with a slice of his own, uh, he can do so with a lot of precision back into Popperin's backhand corner, not allowing him to get a forehand off of that ball. A lot of Popperin slices, however, were actually going to the middle of the court. There were a few times where Popperin tried that really short, low backhand slice down the middle. And boy, did Novak step into the court and whip approach shot forehands that went up and down violently into the court. Just so much whippy topspin that Djokovic was able to get off of that ball. So anytime Popperin tried to kind of goad Novak into a forehand approach shot from a low contact point, Novak responded by absolutely ripping it. And then even with the backhand, I mean, think about one of the most crucial points in the fourth set tiebreak, Popperin hit a pretty decent backhand slice cross court and Djokovic took his two-handed backhand and just drove down with his legs and laced it down the line with laser-like precision off the baseline and forced the error with that backhand down the line. So the slice wasn't working. And then when Popperin was looking to drive his backhand, look, it's just not repeatable enough. If you make Popperin hit five drive backhands in a row, like he's going to miss one. I don't want to say one in every five. Maybe that's extreme. He's going to miss one in every seven drive backhands. So Novak was peppering that. He was getting a lot of, he, he was finding a lot of success there. And overall, Djokovic's baseline game, it looked way closer to normal here. I know that there were, you know, a lot of concerns with some of the stuff we saw on that, that windy day against Jacob Fernley, an opponent who w was pretty trickly, tricky and unfamiliar. And, and Novak just didn't, didn't have it. You know, he wasn't dialed in whatsoever. In this match, the forehand speeds, I imagine, were very healthy. Uh, his positioning was on point. Roof being close helps that. But the ball was coming off clean, whether he was had his feet set in the middle of the court or even on the run, where he looked you know, pretty natural in this match. I don't think that there were a lot of uh, super violent scrambles in my recollection by Djokovic, but there were certainly um, a lot of really good on the run ground strokes from Novak, which had been lacking in the first two rounds. So it's kind of a stock. Up, I think it's like a kind of nerve settling result for Djokovic and his fans. But personally, I know I read some comments uh, some people were surprised that I wasn't hitting the panic button after the Fernley match. I'm just not going to do that thing where we're, you know, swinging our opinion match to match to match, particularly in the first week. Now, I understand you have the health thing, and rightly so, coming off of a surgery, the, the knee is going to be put under a microscope. And it's like, is it okay? Is it good enough to, to win a title? I, I understand all of that, but there's nothing I saw knee-wise, that, that was alarming enough. And ultimately, I think it was a really windy day against uh, an opponent he was unfamiliar with, and he played a bad match, and he still won in four. Like, I, it's the second round. So I'm never going to freak out about that and be like, oh, you know, I don't know if he has it. I don't know if he can win the title playing like that. And I, I he can't win the title playing like that. But the point is, I'm not convinced after a Fernley-like performance that we're going to get the same thing in the fourth round and the quarters and the semis and so on. 
And now we're back to Djokovic playing a good match. Like, I'm just... I don't do the the swing back and forth thing. In reality, first week of a slam, survive, don't exert too much energy. And if you if you play a bad match and you survive, it's all good. The big thing is that you survived. Now, if Djokovic played center tomorrow, I would change my pick. I don't think Novak is is ready to beat an elite player tomorrow. But I still think he'll beat Runa, and then I think he'll keep getting better. So who knows where he'll be once we get to that final Sunday, if he makes it there. At that point, I'll need to ask my I'll need to ask myself that question again. Has Djokovic shown a level at any point? Has Djokovic been close to a level at any point that is capable of taking out a Yannick Sinner type? Obviously, there's no guarantee that Sinner makes the final. I'm just using him as an example of a top player. Quick hitters from here on out, and then I'll go through the fourth round matches. Uh, Pechi Pericard beat Rusevori. The lucky loser run continues for the eye-catching Frenchman. One thing that I saw once again, I've already seen it a couple times. I saw it again, and I want to point it out. Gio has a, I'm going to call him Gio. I don't know if that's going to be a thing. Maybe we'll call him GMP. Uh, Pechi Pericar is, it's probably a lot for like a every time reference thing. Anyway, uh, Gio has a dangerous running forehand that I've seen many times already create some magic in big spots. And this time it was five all in the third set tie break. And it's a little bit, I'm just saying like you do need some magic sauce even if you're a even if you're of a, a serve bot level server, you need to have something. There needs to be something else to what you do. And for Ivo Karlovic, it was the volleys, and for John Isner, it was the forehands from the middle of the court. His ability to run around a a second serve um, and hit a big forehand return. For Riley Opelka, he moves pretty well for six eleven, and he, and he hits his backhand well. So you, there needs to be something. One of the things I've seen so far is, yes, Perry Carr is a huge forehand in general, but he can, even on the move, on the run, he can actually hurt you, which is scary because it only takes one in a tie break where he pulls a rabbit out of his behind and uh, suddenly you're down a mini break. I also want to talk about what happens on the next point in this third set tie break. So now it's 6-5 and Perry Carr misses his first serve. He's got a second serve. What does he do? He hits it huge. I don't know exactly how fast it was. I didn't get a look at the speed gun. But he hits it really, really big. Emil couldn't make clean contact with it. It's a it's a miss hit. It's a short ball sitter. And it's a very easy backhand winner from, um, from Gio with his you know nose on top of the net pretty much. So even on a second serve, he makes it so that his second serve or his serve decides the outcome of the point. That's how he wants to win or lose the point, with his serve. Doesn't matter if it's 6-5 in a, in a third set tie break. Doesn't matter how big the spot is. He has no fear. But what does it look like in the bigger picture? What does it look like if we take all of his second serve points and put it together? How about this, folks? 117 mile per hour average. In a four set match. How many times did he double fault? Five times. Five times in four sets. 117. Spectacular. What was the win percentage? 57%. N- not astronomical, right? But that's because he's he, he can't really hang in a baseline rally with uh with Rusevori all that all that well. And 117, it's it's returnable. You know, it's not going to blow Emil off the court like his first serve will. So that's why it's 57% one, which is gener- which is uh, not, not generous, modest, somewhat modest, but still excellent. The point is, if he didn't have that 117, barely double faulting, then it would be probably 46% points one, 47% points one. That's the difference, right? GMP has taken this two first serve strategy and executing it better than I've, and and committing to it more than I've ever seen anybody commit to it 
and executing it better than I've ever seen anybody execute it. All right, let me go through um, the men's fourth round matches real quick to, to, to wrap this up. Um, just kind of free-flowing off the top of my head. Haven't written down anything for this. Sinner Shelton. So I still see a ton of inconsistencies in Shelton's game. Uh, in, you know, against Shapovalov, he had such a good serve dynamic that it, it wasn't making much of a difference. Uh, but I think Sinner's return of serve should be the difference here to just, just make Shelton play too much. Obviously, three straight five setters for Shelton, no days off. Bad scheduling luck. It's a good spot for Sinner, who crushed Miamir Ketsmanovic in, in his fourth round match. Um, so I go Sinner there. Medvedev Dimitrov. I said before the draw came out, this is the toughest one for me to call. I, I, I really just was a split mind, 50-50, couldn't make a decision. I'd say I'm still there based on everything I've seen. And I'm just going Medvedev based on the best of five set, intangible figure out a way, but ultimately, if I were to give you like a more tangible, I know I just said intangible, let me give you a tangible way in which those intangibles can manifest themselves. I just think Medvedev is way less mistake prone. So it's a tough call for me. There are a lot of patterns and tactics that I think should work well for Dimitrov, particularly against Medvedev's deep return position. But I just think in the big spots and the tight moments, Daniil will limit his mistakes better. Alcaraz Umber, very similar matchup to uh, Tiafo, honestly, for, for Carlos Alcaraz. Umber does more of his taking time away, more of his offensive barrage from the baseline versus coming forward. That's the biggest difference. I actually think that's going to give Alcaraz an opportunity to turn some more points around, go defense to offense, get some extra balls back, and uh, create some errors off the ground from Umber. So I expect Alcaraz's defense to be a factor, and uh, what Alcaraz just needs to make sure to do is serve well enough to avoid Umber uh, aggressive returns, just like he did against Tiafo in, in the final two sets. So he needs to hit his second serve big, he needs to locate his first serves, and hit a lot of body serves, which he, he does well already. And uh, I feel pretty confident about Alcaraz getting through that one. Tommy Paul, Bautista Agut, great run from, from RBA. I worry about him physically as we go into the second week of this slam. Uh, backhand, a backhand. Tommy um, can hang with RBA, and that's normally how Bautista Agut creates advantages. Um, and I, I also expect just Tommy to be physically the much stronger player. So if if the rallies drag out, I think Bautista Goot might end up having to press a little bit. Musetti Pecci Pericard. Very interesting one. I'm going to stick with my pre-tournament pick, go with experience. Uh, Musetti to the quarterfinal. I just think return-wise, Lorenzo will probably be on the back fence just trying to block returns back in play. And I don't expect him to create a lot of high-quality returns, but he's just going to hope that Pechi Pericard makes some mistakes and he gets some misses at some point. I do think, though, compared to the other opponents that Pechi Pericard has faced, Musetti's going to make many more returns in play at the very least. That one is kind of a wild card, though. I don't know what to expect. Zverev Fritz, I think this has five sets written all over it. Historically, in the head-to-head, -head, Zverev has been able to get the edge in those really tight matches for whatever reason. Um, I see them as, you know, I see the movement as the biggest difference generally when these two go up against each other. And therefore, when they play inevitably these kind of extended rallies, especially when the tension is higher, more returns are coming back in play, and you know the key second serve re return points especially. I find that Taylor usually needs to take some more risk compared to Zverev, who I think can play a little bit more within himself in the big spots. Um, so I, I think a lot of this might be on Taylor's racket, which is interesting, but I'm going to go with Zverev. Demon Orfis. Fies has been a little bit up and down. So I think just Demonor's ability, who's, by the way, really well-rested after getting a walkover in the fourth round, 
Uh, Demonor's ability to, first of all, just be more steady and, and even than Feast is going to be a big advantage. And I think Demonor can rush Arthur Feast quite a bit as well and try to get to that forehand. I think keep, keep keeping the ball low to Feast's forehand and in general um, is, is going to be a key tactic. I actually think Demonor is going to win this one in straights. Djokovic, Runa. I feel the same way. I had this pre-tournament. I had this matchup happening. Um, and I think that Holger is going to come at Djokovic with a lot of serve and volley and a lot of net rushing and a lot of kind of run and gun swashbuckling offense. I think Novak will say thank you very much for giving me a target. Thank you very much for allowing me to, to counterpunch, to give you tough volleys. Um, meanwhile, Runa on the return of serve, I still think, again, and, and this is a common theme, like I regard Djokovic's spot serving at such a high level on these grass courts that reward it that I think that Runa, who is not breaking serve this year at a high clip at all, I don't think he's going to win more than 20% of his first serve return points. So I have Novak coming through that one, um, again, being also the, the more level uh, steady player in comparison to Holger. That's all I got. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.